Howdy! In this video we're gonna solve a truss problem. Uh, we're gonna start with the method of the joints and then in another video I'll show you how to solve the same problem with the method of the sections. Okay so the job is gonna be uh, for today to solve for the forces in all the members of the truss as well as to determine if those members are in tension or compression. Now usually the first step to solve the truss problems is gonna be to solve for the forces generated at the support or the reactions. And I say generally because sometimes depending on which of the members you're trying to solve, you might be able to skip that step. In this problem, so since we're solving for all the members, we need to go ahead and start with solving for the support reactions at A and G. So let's go ahead and do that. To begin, we will draw a free body diagram of the whole structure, which I have here already. Remember that's the first step for the free body diagram. The next step is going to be to put the applied forces. So what applied forces do we have in this truss? So we have this 100 Newton load that is being applied at point C over here, but it makes here an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal. So we're going to go ahead and transfer this applied force to this free body diagram of the truss. But before we do, we're gonna go ahead and calculate the X and Y components of that force. Now the horizontal component of the 100 Newton force is gonna be pointing in that direction, right? Because we know this angle 30, then horizontal component is gonna be 100 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And that is gonna give 86, so 86 point 603. The Y component is just going to be 100 times sine of 30. It's going to point down, and this guy is going to be equal to 50 newtons. Next, we're going to go ahead and, and put the reaction forces. So we have here at point A a pin connection, at G, there is a roller. Right? With the roller, there is no guessing. The truss can translate about the x axis, no problem. We can lift the truss, no problem. But we can't just drive it into the ground. The roller is going to resist with a vertical force here that we'll call GY. Now, if we look at point A over here, right, this is pin. It's going to allow rotations about point A, no problem. But we simply can't just grab the truss slide it around the X or around the Y. So we're going to need forces here in the X and in the Y direction. You might want to try to predict where the forces are going to go. And sometimes they're, they're easy. Like for example, in the X direction, the only applied force that I have is going to go that way. So it makes sense that this reaction force at point A is going to point in the opposite direction. If you don't trust me on that one, we'll do the equation of equilibrium and verify this one. Now with the Y component, you might be tempted to say, well, hold on, I have one applied force here in this direction in the Y, and I got this one, so probably I need this um, AY to go up. However, this component over here might wanna try to twist it and rotate it. Let's say we go ahead and think that AY is gonna go up. We'll solve the equations of equilibrium and, and let those tell us if we made a good guess or if we didn't. As I'm checking for a complete list on the free body diagram, again, I have outline, I have applied forces, I have reaction forces, I have my X, my Y axis, as well as geometry. This is four meters, and I'm kind of transferring these down over here, so it is three, three, and three. So when I look at this free body diagram and I want to solve it, I see, look, one red arrow horizontal and two vertical, right? So if I start with some forces in the X direction, I can solve for AX very quickly. You can almost do it by inspections, but here's what the equation of equilibrium will look like. Some of the forces in the X direction, right? We're going to take that direction as positive. So what do I have? I'll sweep the area, the body here from left to right. The first one I have is AX is pointing towards the negative X. So I have minus AX plus 86.603, I'm sorry, in that direction. There's nothing else that is horizontal, so the sum of the two uh, forces must be equal to zero. 
I can solve for AX very quickly by just moving AX to the other side of the equation. So I have AX equals positive 86.03 Newtons. Again, a positive answer means that the direction that I assume is correct. Here, AX points towards the left. So I need to make sure I indicate that with an arrow 86.03 towards the left. Next, I have two forces in the y direction. So it's uh, completely useless just to do the sum of the forces in the y direction here. So instead, what we do is we sum moments. We sum moments at a point where we have the most number of unknowns. Here, we got two unknowns at point A. So naturally, this is a very good point to sum moments. So we said sum of the moments at A must be equal to zero. Again, if it's counterclockwise, it's positive. We're using that convention. So these two are not going to generate a moment as I sweep away and account for all the forces that could generate a moment. The first ones that I see is this one's here. So the first one is 86.603 newtons. That is the force, the perpendicular distance is four meters, right? And it's gonna make it curl in the clockwise or negative moment. The next one is the 50 newton force. The perpendicular distance is gonna be three meters. And again, if I'm pinned here and there's a force pushing down, it's gonna create a clockwise rotation or a negative moment. Next, and finally, we have the GY force it's at a distance of six meters and if i'm pinned here and i push up on the on this body over here it's going to make it rotate counterclockwise so it's a positive moment so i can solve for gy here very quickly i can move all of this to the other side they're going to become positive so and then i can divide by six and this is what the calculator gives me 82.735 it gives a positive number so it means the direction assume is correct here I'm very happy that the direction assume is correct because we know a roller has to push up. If you ever end up with a negative number for a roller, probably means you have an error here on one of the signs or a distance on that moment equation. Anyways, so we saw for the GY. What we do next is we don't put the sum of the forces in the Y. Instead, we will sum moments at another point. Um, so here, another very good point is the point GY, because if we continue with the line of action of AX, it passes through point G. So neither GY nor AX is going to generate a moment, and we could solve for AY rather quickly. Right, so if I'm summing moments at G, I sweep here to the right, there's nothing, then I start sweeping this way, so account for all the forces, I encounter these two guys. The first one is the horizontal force, 86.06. It's at a perpendicular distance of four meters. And if I'm at point G and that force crosses on the above the point G in that direction, it's going to make it spin clockwise. So it'll be a negative moment. Next, the 50 Newton force, it's at a distance of three meters. That's the moment arm to point G, perpendicular distance. And if I'm at G and this force pushes down, this is going to create a counterclockwise moment or a positive one. Next is AY. AY is going to have the opposite direction, right? It's going to be a negative moment. The force is AY and the distance is six meters. That's my moment arm. There's nothing else that will generate a moment. So I have one equation with one unknown. The unknown is AY. I can solve for AY here rather quickly. I can just move this to the other side, right? So I have minus 86 times four plus 50 times three and then divided by positive six. When I type it in the calculator, it gives me a negative number. Again, this quantity is much bigger than this one here. So it gives me a negative answer. What that means is the direction that I initially assumed was incorrect. I should have chosen the opposite sign. So really the AY is 32.735 Newtons and it should point down. Now, does this make sense? Well. The force here in the AX makes some sense. If I have something pushing that way, I need something to bring it back. The AY, the GY makes some sense. The roller can only push up. The AY might be some confusing for some of you because, hey, I have 50 Newtons and I have a force up. How come I'm gonna need to pull them? And, and the answer is, well, we also have this 86.6 uh, Newton force that you kind of try to twist the body that way. And when it twists it, when it twists that direction, it's gonna to try to lift this end of the truss up so the AY pushes down to keep it in equilibrium. We're not done yet. I always suggest, especially for the trusses, is let's go ahead and check at least that AY and the GY 
are correct. How can we do that? Well, we'll sum forces in the y direction now and make it equal to zero. And we'll just check if the answer makes sense. So AY we said was 32.735, it's pointing down, right? So that's a negative force. So minus 32.735 plus, I'm sorry, minus 50, because the 50 is pointing down. And then we have GY, which we said was 82. So plus 82.735. And now we plug it in the calculator and we ask ourselves, does this equal zero? And if it does, it means that we have the value of AY and GY correct. Hope you can see here that minus 32 minus 50 is minus 82.735 plus positive, right? These two is going to give us, the sum of those is going to give us zero. So now we got confirmation that our value for AY and the value for GY are correct. I always, always suggest that you do that because every free body diagram that we do afterwards, whether we do method of the joints or method of the sections, is going to use these numbers. If these are off, then everything else will be off. So now that I'm very confident with the reaction forces at A and G, I'm going to go ahead and put those values in here and I'm going to treat, in, treat them as given or applied forces. So instead of having this GY in red, which, which is what I personally use to, to designate an unknown, now I'm going to treat it as a known force or just an applied force on this truss. So remember a GY was 82.735 newtons and it's going up over here and then we have our ax remember we determine ax to go here towards the left like so with a value of 86.60 sorry that should be a six six zero three and our ay does not point up remember we determined here that it points down, so this is a down arrow, and it has a magnitude of 32.735 newtons, and this is newtons. So I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this so that we can start now applying the method of the joints to figure out what's going on in each of the members. Now I went ahead and put a list here of all the members so that it helps us with the accounting. Again, we're going to solve for the force in each of the members and determine if they're in tension or compression. First, we'll do it with the method of the joints. In another video, we'll do the same one with the method of the sections. So let's go ahead and begin. Remember, when we're doing the method of the joints, we're looking at, you want to think of it like as the pins over here. We're going to have what we call concurrent forces, meaning they all meet at one point, and they're also coplanars. They're in two dimensions or in the same plane. What that means for us is that we can ensure that that joint isn't going to be in equilibrium if we make sure that the sum of the forces in the x and the sum of the forces in the y are equal to zero. Now what that means for us as well is because we have two equations, we can all only solve for two unknowns for every free body diagram. So anytime you want you start with the free body diagrams, you need to start at a point where at least you have just two unknowns. So when we look at this free body diagram of the truss, if I look at point A, for example, then that's my initial point. I have unknown AH, AC, and AB. That's three unknowns, so that's not a good place. You never want to start at a joint where you have three unknowns. If we look at point B, for example, we would only have two unknowns, the force in member um, that goes from B to A, which is the same thing as AB, and B BC. So this here is a good point to start, right? C is not a good point. We would have one, two, three, four unknowns. H is not a good point, B or G, right? Another good point could be point F over here. This is another good point to start because on, on here we would have only GF or FG as an unknown and EF as an unknown. So those are the two points uh, that you want to start with. Again, always just the point where you have two unknowns because you only have two equations. So let's go ahead and start. Let's do the free body diagram at this point B. Right, so I'm going to draw this point B, which is this guy. 
And then at point B, I have two members making contact. Member from A to B, we'll call it AB, and from B to C. So AB and BC. Usually the naming that we follow for these trusses, there's actually two ways to do it. One, we will call this one BA because it goes from A to B and BC. Another one is just to look at the two letters and, and call them alphabetically, for example. This one would be AB, this one BC, and so on and so forth, which is kind of what I did over here. So that's what I did here as well. I'm just using the two points and I'm rearranging them alphabetically, AB, BC. So we picked a point, we have two unknowns. The next thing is, what do we do, right? Hopefully you remember that we always assume the arrows to point away and when we do, when we um, make the arrows away, the assumption that we're doing is that we're assuming that those members are under tension. Again, those might be correct assumptions or might be incorrect. The equations of equilibrium are going to tell us that. So here I make the arrows pointing away. Um, if I want to be like super complete about this free body diagram, I will need here the X and the Y axis. And that would be it. The next thing we would do is apply the equations of equilibrium. When I would look at this guy. I have one force in the X, one in the Y. So it really doesn't matter which equation do I start with first. If I say some of the forces in the X must be equal to zero, right? Anything that points in that direction must be positive. I have BC. This arrow, I have no other arrows. So the sum of those forces, even if it's just one, has to be equal to zero, so that force is going to be zero. Do you remember what we call these over here? Right? We call this zero force members. So BC is going to be a zero force member. The force is zero. Now you remember the shortcut that we said. We said we can identify zero force members by just looking at a truss. And anytime we have two members, that are not, that are joined at an angle. So anywhere, anywhere except collinear. So let's say we have one, there's a joint over here and the other one, this is the only case that does not apply. So anything else at any angle, 90 degrees, 30, 50, whatever. Anytime you got two members that are meeting that are not collinear and that there's no external forces applied, we can see over here that there's no external forces. Right, those two members are going to be zero force members. We just applied the equation of equilibrium over here and we kind of just proved that for member BC. Notice if we do the sum of the forces in the Y, right, we would only have this arrow over here. There's no external loading, so this guy has to be equal to zero, right? So both BC and AB are zero force members. Now, since I just refreshed you what the zero force members are and how to identify them, could you look at the figure over here and identify two other zero force members? Well, again, we're looking for two members that are meeting uh, at an angle, right? That they're not collinear and that there's no external loads, right? So um, as I'm scanning over here, right? Point D, for example, has one, two, three, four unknowns. That's not it. Point E has one, two, three unknowns. That's not it. But we also have point F over here. There's two members intersecting. There's no external loads. Hopefully you can now see it by inspection or just go ahead and draw the free body diagram for that point. And you're going to very quickly realize, right, that if I sum forces in the X or in the Y, both GF or FG has to be a zero force member. So this guy's zero force member. Also EF has to be a zero force member. So now look at what happens, right? By inspection, now we determine FG member, this guy is zero force member, and so is this one. So it's like this guy is no longer there. So now look what would happen at point E. Now we would have two members that are meeting at some angle, there's no external load. So guess what that's gonna mean? Yes, EG and the E is also gonna be a zero force member. I'll do the quick free body diagram. So this is F, B, D at point E. 
So what do we have at E? We had three unknowns, right? We got a DE. This guy, which I'll call EG, and the one pointing, I'm going to assume pointing down, which was initially tension. Yeah. But again, by looking at this point, we already concluded that that guy is a zero force member. So it's like this guy is not there. It's not doing anything. There's no external load, right? So if I sum forces in the Y, EG has to be zero. And if I sum forces in the X, since this guy is zero, right? I would only have DE, so that guy would also have to be zero. So DE is zero. And E to G is also a zero force member. Now, are there any zero force members left? Well, now it's getting kind of hard just to do it by inspection again. The E is zero force member, but at point D I have one, two, three. I really can't tell right there, so I'm not gonna say anything until I get to the free body diagram there. Both GF and E to G are zero force member, so that would leave us with two members here at G, but there's an external load, so that's gonna mean that at least one of those is not gonna be a zero force member. And so we're pretty much, uh, we're pretty much stuck there. Um, as far as finding zero force members by inspection, hey, but we can continue doing the free body diagrams at the various joints to figure out what everything is going on or what's going on in all the body. So I'm going to put a quick uh, little tick mark by the member so I know that I already solved those. Again, we said A to B is zero force member, B to C is zero force member, GF, EF are zero force member, and we also said Look, the E is zero force member, and even EG is zero force member. Right, so we still have to solve for all of these guys over here. How about, um, let's try to go alphabetical. And I say let's try because, again, anytime we do a joint or free body diagram, we need to make sure we only have two unknowns. So if I try to go somewhat alphabetical, say I start with point A over here. Um, this guy is zero, so I know that guy is zero, and I would have just two unknowns. So that's a good free body diagram to start with. So let's go free body diagram at point A. This is what it looks like. So I have um, point A. And then I have the forces from the pins that we previously determined. So horizontal here towards the left, 86.603. And then the vertical one, the pin one goes down 32.735. They all have the same units of Newton, so I'm not gonna write it. Again, A to B is zero force member, so that would leave me with A to H, A H, I'm going to assume tension on this guy, so the arrow pointing away. I'm going to assume tension on the member A to C. So an arrow pointing here from A to C. We're almost done with this free body diagram, right? It's just a particle equilibrium. So I have the outline, which is just a little point. I have applied loads. I have unknown or uh, unknown loads. I would need still, for example, here an X and a Y axis. And the only other thing that I need, I don't need dimensions to solve these problems because they're concurrent forces, but I do need angles. So let's take a look at this. This base of this kind of triangle over here is three meters. The height is four. Hopefully you remember maybe from your high school days, this is going to give a three, four, five right triangle so we could we could take advantage of that three four and five or we could calculate that angle either of the two methods work so now we have a complete free body diagram so let's go ahead and apply the equations of equilibrium again we got two some of the forces in the x and some of the forces in the y when i look at this free body diagram over here I look at my unknowns and both AH and AC have horizontal components. 
So both of them are going to show up in that equation. That's not a good equation to start with. If I look at the sum of forces in the Y, only a C is going to participate. That's the only one with a vertical component. That's a better equation to start with. So sum of the forces in the Y equals to zero. Again, if it points up, it's going to be positive. Well, what do I have pointing up? I have the Y component of this force AC. So what is this Y component going to be? It's AC times times 4 divided by 5 will give us the Y component. Again, that one points up, so it's positive. These two are horizontal. They're not going to participate in this equation. And we have finally this one over here. So minus, because it's pointing down, 32.735. The sum of those two forces must be equal to 0. We can solve for AC in this equation by just moving the 32 to the other side. It's going to become positive, then multiplying by 5 and dividing by 4. So 32.735 times 5 divided by 4. This is going to give a value of 40.913. Again, this is the AC. Again, this is negative, move to the other side, becomes positive, and we can divide the whole thing by four fifths. This is the answer that we get, it's positive. So what that means is that the direction that I assume is correct. Again, because I assume AC to point away from the point of interest, from the, from the joint, away means tension, so I can say, hey, the force is 40.19 newtons, and this guy is under tension. Now that we know AC, right, we can go ahead and do the sum of the forces in the x direction and make it equal to zero. Anything that points to the right is positive. So pointing to the right, I have AH, all of it, and I have, look at this. Here I drew a C pointing in that direction, so it's going to have a positive X component. What is the X component? A C times 3 divided by 5. Okay, we got those two taken care of and then pointing towards the negative X is 86. So minus 86.603 must be equal to 0. Again here, we already solved for AC, so we can take this value and just put it in here and solve for AH. Now to solve for AH, what would I do? Right, AH is positive already, so I would move this to the other side, so we would have 86.603. This is positive, so when I go to the other side, it's going to become negative, so minus the value of AC, which is 40.919 times 3 divided by 5. Now, if I didn't make any mistakes on the calculator, this gives me a value of 62.052. Again, this is the value for AH. It's a positive quantity, so it means the direction that I assumed is correct. I had assumed AH to point away from the point. Away is tension. So I can say, hey, the force is 62.052 newtons and it's in tension. All right, so I'll go ahead and mark off AC value, this guy, and AH value over here, just so I keep track. And I'm gonna go ahead and transfer these forces over here. So AC we said was 40. 0.919 newtons tension and AH 62.052 newtons in tension. So we're done with A, we've done this point over here. Now we can move away, right, from, from this point and now let's try to pick what's a good next point. So 
if we go here, I said I was going to try to do alphabetically. So let's see if it's possible. So if I look at this point C now, let's see how many unknowns we have. Well, we already saw for BC and for AC. So the unknown would be from C to H and CD. It's only two. So that means we can solve this one. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's do the free body diagram at point C. So point C looks something like this. What do we have at point C? Let's start with the applied loads. We have horizontal of 86.603. The vertical is pointing down of 50. Next, what else we have? Well, we have member BC, but you remember this member BC is zero force member, so it doesn't do anything. AC over here, we determined to be 40.919 in tension. So again, tension means away. So that means I have something that looks like this with the value of 40.919 newtons. And then I have C to H, that's my unknown number one. I'm gonna assume tension, so C, H. And unknown number two is gonna be C, D. Again, I will assume tension. We're almost done with this free body diagram. I have the outline, applied or known loads, unknowns. Here's our X and here's our Y axis, right? If I wanna solve this guy, the only thing I'm missing here is some geometry, right? So remember, this stole transfers three, four, five, the slope triangle. Okay, so let's look at this one. I have unknown in the X and unknown in the Y. So here there's no advantage to starting with either of the equations. So I'm just gonna start with the first one. Sum of the forces in the X equals to zero, right? If it points in that direction, it's positive. So what do I have in the X? I have positive 86. I'm gonna go down here so I have enough room. 86.603, that was positive, it points in that direction. The other one is this guy, 40.919, but not all of it, right? We just need the horizontal component, so we gotta multiply times three by five. And notice which way is the horizontal component, right? The vertical is down, the horizontal is here to the left, that's negative. We need to put there a negative. And then the last one is gonna be the unknown, which is CD. And here we assume to be pointing in tension, right? So in that direction, so plus CD. And the sum of those forces must be equal to zero. We can solve for CD very quickly from this equation, right? All I have to do is move all of this to the other side. So that tells me I'm going to have negative 86.603 plus 40.919 times 3 divided by 5. And so the value that I get for CD is negative negative 62.052. What does this negative mean? Negative means the direction I assumed was incorrect. I had assumed a way or tension, it should point into, right? So this should be under compression. Again, because I got a negative when I had assumed tension or positive. So CD over here is I'm going to put it over here, 62.052, but compression, C for compression. This is the next equation of equilibrium. Sum of forces in the Y must be equal to zero. Remember, if it points up, it's positive. So what do I have? I have uh, 50 pointing down, so minus 50. I have the vertical component of this force, so 40.919, the vertical component is gonna be four divided by five, right? It's pointing down, so it's also negative, negative, negative. 
and even CH over here is pointing down. So minus CH. equals zero. Here is one that sometimes confuses some students. So let me put the caps so I can explain. This is one that might confuse students. And why do I say confused? Um, because here we assume, again, that CH is tension because it's pointing away. And when I did the sum of the forces in the y, I did a negative. Why negative? Well, because the arrow is pointing towards a positive y. Why is some co that confusing? Because maybe from materials you remember that a tensile force is kind of positive or points away and compression is negative because it makes it smaller. Some of you might get that mixed up. Um, I get it. But whenever we're summing the forces, right, we're just looking at the drawing that we made and where those arrows are pointing. Anything that points down is going to be negative. Anything that points up will be positive when we're summing forces in the y. If it's in the x, just look at the arrows. Is the arrows point towards the right for positive x? They're positive values. If anything points towards the left for negative x axis, there's going to be negative. Anyway, so we have CH over here. We can solve for CH very quickly. What would I do? I would move it to the other side so it becomes positive. And so CH would be equal to this quantity over here. So negative 50 minus 40.919 times 4 divided by 5. So if I plugged it in correctly in the calculator, I get that CH, I get the marker, CH is equal to negative 82.9. Three, five. Again, negative means a direction that I assumed was incorrect. I had assumed away for tension, so it should be positive. I'm sorry, it should be pointing into or compression. So CH is 82.735 in compression. So let's go ahead and put the tick marks over here. Um, we solve for AC and AH, AC, AH over here, and also for CD and CH. So now we know this guy and this guy. Let's see if we can continue to do the free body diagrams alphabetically. There is no reason to do it alphabetically. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can do it like some, like I guess, personal challenge. Really, when you're doing the, the, the method of the joints, what you should be looking for is every time you do a point is, let's say we go here to point C, what you should be asking yourself is, okay, which point do I go next? If I go down to H, is that a good point? I don't know. How do I know if it's a good point? Again, you want to make sure that you only have two unknowns. So if I go do the free body diagram at point H over here, I only know these two guys. Right, so my unknowns would be HD or DH and this other guy. That's a good point. So it doesn't mean that, oh, I have to do it alphabetically here. AH is, is it's a completely valid point. If I go to point D, right, I need to ask myself, how many unknowns do I have? Well, I already have this one and that one. So my unknowns would be HD or DH and DG over here, this guy. Right, so that's also a valid point. The free body diagram at point D. And here the tip is when you're solving your homework, especially on the exams, you want to tell your professor where it is that you're doing that uh, some of the forces here, the joint. So you need to specify, tell it free body diagram at a joint D, which is this guy. Let's go ahead and draw it up. So. There's my point D, that's my letter D. I know what um, CD is, right? CD is 62.052 compression, right? So how are we gonna do that one? Well, we always say if a way is tension, then towards the point is gonna be compression, right? So here I'm looking at point D, so I need to draw the CD towards point D an arrow that way. Again, away is tension, 
into the point is going to be compression. What is the value of CD? Well, we wrote it over here. This is 62.052. We got that guy. The E, if you remember, was a zero force member. So I don't even need to put an arrow here because I already determined this guy to be zero. I don't want to confuse myself by putting any unnecessary arrows there. So next we have the two unknowns. Straight down we have DG. And going from D to H, we have DH. Right? Those two are unknowns. These guys are unknown. So I'm going to go with the convention, which is just, I'm going to assume away, which means I'm assuming these guys are in tension. What else do I need on a free body diagram? Hey, I have outline or the body of interest. Right? I have applied loads. I have unknowns. It would be nice to include here an X and a Y axis, right? As well as any geometry that we may need. So for this guy, we know we've been using the slope triangle, three, four, five. Again, because if this is three and this is four, then the hypotenuse has to be five. And I think that's it. I think I have all the information in here so that I can solve this free body diagram. I have just two unknowns, so I can solve it. I can use either of the two equations, but I want to ask myself, which one is more efficient? What is my better option? Well. If I look in the X, right, the H has a contribution to the X, a horizontal component, DG doesn't. So that's a good one to start. So sum of the forces in the X must be equal to zero. Again, if it points in that direction, it's positive. So what do I have? I have uh, 62.052. That arrow is pointing towards the positive x direction. So this guy is a positive force. And then I have the horizontal component from the h. So the h times 3 divided by 5. And I have nothing else. Remember, this horizontal component from the h points toward the negative x axis. So I have to say minus. Those are the only two arrows here horizontally, so the sum of those two must be equal to zero. I can solve for dh very quickly in this equation, right? How? Well, I can move this to the other side, and I can take 62.52 times 5 divided by 3. Let's go ahead and type that in the calculator. So 62.052 times 5 divided by 3. This gives 103, 103.42. It gives a positive number. Remember, I moved this to the other side, so that's positive. Positive on both sides, it's positive number. Means that dh, right, our assumption, which is pointing away, was a correct assumption. So that this guy is under tension. So next, let's go ahead and do the sum of the forces in the y direction. What do I have in the Y? Well, just these two, right? I have DG, right? All of it is pointing towards the negative Y axis, so minus DG, and then minus the horizontal component of DH, which is going to be DH times 4 divided by 5. And I got nothing else at this point D. So the sum of those two forces must be equal to zero. Remember, we already know what the H is, so I can go ahead and put it there. So I can move this to the other side becomes positive. Right? Remember, the H was, sorry, the H was a positive number because we got tension. So I'm going to move this to the other side. So I'm going to have uh, 103.42 times 4 divided by 5 gives me 82. 82.736.
Again, I move this to the other side, so that becomes positive, but we have minus over here. So when we move it to the other side, this is going to tell us negative, which means that dg, right? Negative means the direction assumed is incorrect. So I had assumed away or tension really it points uh, into, or it should be under compression. So this is the same thing as under compression. So let me go ahead and record this over here. Where's our DG? DG over here is 82.736 compression. The H was 103.42 in tension. So I started writing the units here, Newtons and newtons and then I stopped using it just remember all of these are in units of newtons ah this reminds me there's one common mistake that I see with the method of joints right when I look at the at the joint D I'm looking at what's going on at this point some people get confused and they see this down at this arrow over here at the bottom pointing up and they want to treat it as a sliding vector and just say this this vector is being applied at point D. But when we're working with trusses, no, 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 you, you cannot slide those vectors, right? This one's touching G, it's not touching D, so I don't need that force over there. Forget about making those, those mistakes like that. Um, there we go, I think we're almost done. We only need a member CH, I'm sorry, is that CH? So we just figured out the H so D to H, this guy, and we figured out D to G. The one that's missing is this one. It's not uh, C to H, it's G to H. So that should be a letter G. That's the one we're missing, right? How can we solve for that one? Well, we can do a free body diagram at joint H because the member is attached there. Or we can use the free body diagram at point G. Since I said I was going to try to do alphabetically, let's go with the free body diagram at G. So what do I have at G? Well, here's my point G over here. Next, I'm going to put my gnomes. So GF, we determined to be zero force member. Remember, uh, GF, zero. That guy is zero. This guy was zero, EG. Where is it? Over here, zero force member. DG, we just figured it out. DG is 82.736 compression, right? So what does compression mean? Again, away is tension, compression means to the point. So it's like this, it's 82.736, okay? So zero member, zero member, that's that one. And then we have our unknown over here. I'm gonna assume a way or tension, which is GH over here. I need to cut my markers. And what else do I have? Well, I have this um, reaction here from the rotor. We treat it like an applied load. It's an arrow pointing up. And look at this. This one is 82.735. That's it. Again, zero force member, zero force member. We know that guy, and this is unknown. This is our free body diagram. So let's take a look at it. Our only unknown is in the x direction. So if we sum forces in the x direction, we make them equal to zero. Again, this is our x axis and this guy is our y axis. In the x direction, I only have gh. Here it's pointing towards the negative x, so I have minus gh. But take a look at this. I, that's the only one I have, so that one has to be zero, so it means gh has to be zero. So this Y is a tricky one, but this GH is actually a zero force member as well. If we do the sum of forces in the Y, we got an arrow pointing up, so plus 82.735 minus 82.736. 
right? And hopefully you can see that these two are gonna balance out, they're off over here, see, by one tens hundred thousandths of a Newton, right? This is carry over from just rounding, um, but it's beautiful because the two are canceling, essentially canceling each other out. So that's it, we're done. We solved all the members over here. GH happens to be a zero fours member. Hopefully you found this video useful. I wanna just repeat a little bit the steps that we did to solve the truss with the method of the joints. Again, we started with the free body diagram of the whole truss and we solved for the pin support at A and the roller at G. Once we had that, we started doing the free body diagrams at the joints. Remember when you're choosing to start with a joint, choosing alphabetically is probably not a good idea. What you wanna look at is let's start at a joint where there's only two uh, truss joints or two unknowns as best as you can. So here B was a good choice, F was a good choice. We started solving those and eventually you start knocking these guys and then you're just looking for joints where you have two unknowns. For this example, it was kind of nice that I was able to go alphabetically, but don't be afraid to jump around. Jump around, letters don't mean anything. They're just identifying the points. Um, just look for a point where you have two unknowns. Again, when you draw the free body diagram of the joint, right it's just going to be a little particle a little point there for the joint um you're going to put any applied forces like here at g you're going to put them over here i like to color them blue so i treat them as knowns um and then any unknowns i like to color them red again what are the unknowns going to be the forces in the members you can't try to look at it and try to predict where it's going if you don't want to bother that way, it's completely fine. Just assume, go with the convention where we assume um, the arrow pointing away, which means that member is in tension. If once you solve the equation of equilibrium, you get a positive number, it means yes, that member was in tension. If you get a negative number, it means, hey, we got the sense correctly. The arrow should point uh, 180 degrees. And it will usually, it means, gonna, it means compression again. A negative will mean compression only if to begin with you assume the arrows away or intention. And I think that is that is it for this one. Hopefully you liked the video and you found it uh, useful. I'm gonna go ahead and solve the same uh, truss over here using method of sections to solve for a couple of these members. So I'll show you that one. Um, I'll, I'll link the video here. And hopefully we'll see that with the method of the sections, I can check my work over here. Anyways, um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.